My name is Nora Toomey. I'm a partner in Cartoon Saloon. I'm a director. I directed uh, The Breadwinner. I co-directed uh, The Secret of Kells and I've uh, just finished My Father's Dragon, which will be uh, on Netflix from November 11th this year. How did you start your career in animation? I guess I kind of stumbled into animation, so I, I, um, I didn't really set out to be a director or an animator even. I, I always loved to draw. Um, so from an early age I, I drew, but then when a lot of children kind of stopped drawing around the age of 10, 11, uh, I kept going. Um, and so it became a kind of a, a lifeline for me. I, um, I left school early when I was about 15. Uh, I worked for a couple of years and then in my early 20s I went back into education. Initially with an idea of becoming an artist, um, a painter, uh, and then I discovered animation, discovered that you could continue to draw, you could draw for a living. And so that was, that was why I um, kind of went back into, into education and into animation. Um, and when I was in college, I met uh, Tom Moore, Paul Young, and a number of people with whom I still work with today in Cartoon Saloon. How was the studio Cartoon Saloon founded? Uh, it was back in 1999, I think was when the, the company was incorporated. Okay, so it was, it was okay. back then. We were, we were students together in the mid 90s um, and we started kind of initially kind of informally kind of working together you know if there was something that uh, one of us was doing that was managing you know to to earn a little a bit of money then that's what we did when we were still in college and then uh, Tom and Paul incorporated the company I think it was 1999 I went to work for a, a company in Dublin called Brown Bag for a year I was a year ahead of Tom and Paul and so uh, when they graduated, we all went to Kilkenny, um, in, you know, including uh, Jeremy Purcell, uh, Fabian Erlinghauser, uh, a number of uh, other people that I still work with uh, today. There's there about 12 of us. And when we started, we just, uh, we managed to make a couple of short films to start with. I was uh, lucky enough to be able to direct a couple of short films, which I really found it was a massive education for me. Uh, we did anything we could to keep the lights on. We did commercials, we did um, kind of early, uh, early kind of like uh, digital greeting cards. We worked in flash um, uh, as well as on paper. And eventually around, uh, around um, let me think, I, it, yeah, I think it was like 2001, 2002, we started to, uh, well, we started, we made a, a, like a proof, proof of concept teaser for The Secret of Kells. And we managed to uh, take that to animation market and then attract um, producers uh, yeah. to the project. And so therefore we found our co-producers. Is there a reason to choose 2D animation in a 3D dominated world? Yeah, a 2D animation for us in Cartoon Saloon has always been such an expressive medium. I think we're really attracted because we went to college together learning like how, you know, the master animators, you know, built their craft and um, I suppose being really interested in what the, the, the hand can do, uh, being interested in how, um, you know, how both the brush stroke, you know, can be visible in an artwork and yet also be in an immersive uh, world. And then uh, how the hand can be, you know, visible in terms of, uh, you know, how, how 2D animation comes across on the screen. For us, that's part of the process, that's part of the story. And therefore, it's, it's, it's a very interesting medium. So we do use some 3D, but as a supportive um, software for our 2D, uh, we just find that the, the, the look of 2D and the fact that, it, that it's visibly made by human hand, the craft of it is uh, very important to us. It also doesn't date that much. You know, I, if I look back um, 2007, 2008, when um, The Secret of Kells was first released, if we had made that in 3D, it would look extremely dated now. But um, it kind of looks like it could have been made yesterday because it's made with the craft of, yeah. of 2D animation. I think another thing with 2D animation, and I think this is specific to do, to do with the streaming services and how um, all kinds of filmmaking and storytelling are available to all kinds of audiences on demand now. Um, I just find it really interesting, even seeing the way that my own children will jump from you know, a, a 2D uh, piece of animation to 3D, to live action, back to 2D again, and they're just following characters and stories. They're not, uh, they're not making a judgment on what something looks like or whatever, you know, or, or, uh, or, or they're not into one specific way of something, you know, looking. They are, uh, they're really open to whatever, whatever medium is in front of them. And I think that's something specific to the last, um, 
the last number of years since the streaming services came on board and people have more choice and therefore it's kind of broadened um, the, the, the scope of what, what's out there for people to, to, to look at in terms of storytelling. You have worked as director and as producer. What is the difference? Which role do you prefer? There is, there is. When you're producing, you're very much in a supportive role for the director and you're just trying to make sure that the means is there, there for them to have their voice for the team as well, for our, our team in Cartoon Saloon and for our co-producers, you know, that, that we have that kind of a, a supportive feeling and, uh, and making sure that the, the, you know, the ethos of the company is, is kind of, you know, built into the, the projects that we do, make sure that it's really um, like a, 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 a a nice place to work and nice to work on, on projects together. Uh, in terms of directing, of course, then you have to make sure that the, you know, your vision is, is, is carried forward onto the screen. That of your team, as a, as a director, you're also serving your entire team. So you're communicating and making sure that you get, you know, the best of your team is, uh, is on the screen. Um, and so there, there are two very different uh, ways of working. Directing is much, much harder. <laughs> Uh, much more labor intensive um, you know you, you have to be it's you know it's, it's more demanding and so therefore I like to switch between the two so you direct and then you you produce for a while so that you can build back up your strength but also you get to it, because you know having been like both a director and a producer you know what a director needs um, uh, and you know how to facilitate that uh, when you're when you're producing um, but it's a very different mindset. It's really not, you're not, you know, trampling over somebody else's kind of storytelling uh, uh, way, you know, when you're, when you're producing. It really is a, 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 a facilitating kind of role. Uh, but in Cartoon Saloon, I suppose what we're, we're most wanting to do is to kind of build a culture in the studio where, you know, it is very expressive and it is, you know, a, 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 like a storytelling company. Um, and so, therefore, it's, it's important that um, you know, the, us, myself and Tom and Paul as leaders of the company, that, that we kind of continue that, that nice um, culture in the studio where it's quite open and it's quite, you know, um, uh, it, you know infused with the kind of storytelling values that we, that we you know, we, we've kind of, you know, kept over the last 20 years. You directed The Breadwinner, that is different in style and story if compared to the previous movies by Cartoon Saloon. What made you choose to tell that story? Yeah, I, I had co-directed uh, The Secret of Kells with, with Tom. Um, uh, and I guess that was a... I had done shorts before, so that was a huge... Uh, a huge undertaking. And I guess us as a young studio as well, it was, it was a massive undertaking. And then I came on as a... had a story on, on Song of the Sea and just uh, tried to help Tom and Will, the screenwriter, uh, kind of craft the story and the, the feeling of the film. Um, when it came to the breadwinner, I wasn't really actively looking to direct something. Um, I, uh, it's just that the story really struck me. Um, it really, really struck me. And the character of Piranha really, really struck me. And I just felt that it was something that needed to be put up on the screen and that needed to have a light shone on it. And it was a story that um, needed to be told. Um, and so we began a big kind of research uh, phase when we were um, crafting the screenplay for uh, The Breadwinner uh, involving a lot of Afghan people and not just um, people who had, uh, you know, been in Afghanistan during the, the, the first uh, Taliban era there, but people who had, um, you know, been there and left and returned uh, at different points in, in kind of recent Afghan history. And therefore we got kind of a, a larger picture of what it must be like to be a child growing up in conflict and that's why um, we wanted to tell the story from that perspective so not to over politicize the film or um, you know over intellectualize it we really just wanted to show what it would be like from the perspective of a child and animation is uniquely suited to that uh, stories like that because it, it tends to let our audience in a little bit more I think than live action I think with live action and a story that is of such high um, intensity uh, your audience might break away you know emotionally and so uh, that's why animation I think is you know we've seen it with uh, you know films like Flea or Persopolis uh, you know it's a it's a, a fantastic medium for tackling uh, stories that are that bit more challenging. What struck you about the story of My Father's Dragon and made you choose to direct the film? 
Yeah, I think what was most interesting for me with My Father's Dragon, so I was introduced to the, uh, the book uh, before I actually directed The Breadwinner. It was about 2012 when I first met uh, Julie Lin, who's one of our producers on the project. And uh, when I read the book first, I, um, there was a particular page where uh, Elmer, who's the, the protagonist, uh, the main character in the film, he and his mom have an argument about um, a bowl of milk. He gives a cat a bowl of milk, just a stray alley cat, and she gets really angry with him um, over that. And I just thought it was a, it was an extraordinary page in a, in a children's book because mums, mothers in, in, in any kind of storytelling, uh, they're not really allowed to be flawed. And so I thought it was really refreshing to have a, a, a mother character who isn't perfect and strong, and the, you know the, 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 the you know this, this, this superhero type kind of you know gel that holds the whole family together. She was flawed. I thought that was amazing, and so that was something I felt I could put on the screen. I was also really interested in Elmer's reaction to you know the the mom who was obviously very stressed and not able to kind of cope with her particular set of circumstances. Uh, I really wanted to explore what it was like for him to um, to to experience a moment like that. And so uh, with Meg Lefauve, our writer, we kind of started to build out the story from moments like that, uh, fearful moments. Uh, we talked to a child psychologist about what it's like when children undergo a huge amount of change in their lives. My, I you know, had two children, uh, young children at the time myself, and so I knew what it was like for children to experience things that are really challenging and how they cope, how they use their imagination and their own storytelling uh, capabilities to try and make sense of the world around them. them. And so that became, that's the kind of heart of the story. Uh, and so we don't really shy away from things that are a little bit more challenging in My Father's Dragon, but yet it's a very, um, uh, it's a warm story. You know, it's, it's, it's a story for all ages and it's one that while there's challenges in there, there's a huge sense of adventure. There is um, a, a, a really um, seminal, friendship at the very heart of that whole uh, film and uh, yeah it's, it's so th that was my way in that th those kind of themes were, were my way into the film. What did you want to tell in My Father's Dragon? What are the themes covered? So the story is about a, a young boy called Elmer who kind of loses everything that he's familiar with and everything that he holds dear and has to start again while there's more stuff going on in his life than he's uh, capable of understanding, while his mom is trying to shield him from certain realities. And in doing so, she actually frightens him more than if she had you know, managed to be kind of straight with him in some way in the first place. And so Elmer goes to try to find something that's going to solve all these problems. And he uh, goes off in search of this dragon who he thinks is going to uh, you know, be, be the, the answer to everything. But that dragon, turns out to be a, a kid just like him that doesn't have answers either and so he and the dragon uh, Boris must uh, try and m navigate the world around them uh, and and try and um, try and escape uh, this uh, the, the incredible world called Wild Island which is a sinking a sinking island and so that's the that's the kind of uh, basic premise of the, the the story but it is I think at, at its heart a story that really is like a warm hug you know it, it really does feel like a, it's an exploration of friendship uh, of childhood of um, kind of you know the passing of a threshold the coming of age and those are all themes that I as a, a, a filmmaker and a, a storyteller and a lot of people on my team actually um, were kind of interested in uh, just kind of expressing that that particular time in children's lives where if you make a friend you, you choose a friend yourself and that friendship feels like it's the center of the whole universe the backgrounds in the studio's previous movies have a more flat, two-dimensional look. What art direction choices were made for this film? So um, I guess with the, the so the Secret of Kells was the first film that we did a, like a really kind of like a, a, a flat representation on the on the screen. Uh, the reason for that was the source material. So the the Book of Kells, this uh, ninth-century uh, manuscript. Uh, which was the kind of the, 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 the first piece of inspiration that inspired the look of the film. I think before that we had been looking outside of ourselves and looking towards some of the larger studios, you know, and, and even our, our own kind of uh, classical animation education was kind of like a, an influence for us. And so therefore looking at Irish culture uh, and particularly that time, that, that kind of, um, you know, ninth century uh, 
um, a style of uh, uh, depiction of you know uh, artwork was uh, was what m suited that film uh, the, uh, the best and the most I think um, with uh, with my father's dragon we wanted our audience to feel immersed in the story so while it has a very strong uh, art direction and a kind of a, a appealing way of uh, com uh, composing the the shots in the film we wanted our audience to feel that they are part of the frame um, and in order for them to feel like that they are part of the friendship between Elmer and Boris or to, for them to feel in the center of the, the friendship between Elmer and Boris we wanted the frame to similarly feel like it was surrounding them so almost a, a subconscious sense that if you turned around that you would see more you know more of Wild Island behind you our sound designers also came at it with that kind of an attitude um, where they they kind of made sure that the sound was so immersive that you got the sense that you were on the island with Elmer and Boris because as much as we wanted to make sure that Elmer felt um, insecure on that island we also wanted our audience to feel that little bit insecure and so therefore when Elmer feels like fear in the pit of his stomach we wanted our audience to feel that too and the way to do that was to introduce a bigger sense of gravity uh, with the film a bigger sense of scale when Elmer runs from a character, we needed to make sure that our audience knew that they weren't confused by the space, that they knew that there was, you know, a certain amount of steps between him and the character that was chasing him, for example. And so that's what it was the, the, the character's needs that led to the, the look of the film. What are the most interesting trends and technologies for the future of animation? Yeah, you know, I, I think AI is really interesting. And I think that, you know, it, uh, we, we're quite used to kind of a linear storytelling, which is which is really good because I think as, as storytellers and as directors, um, you need to have something to say. And that something to say can't be everything and every, you know, every potential, you know, outcome of a situation or anything like that. So I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's interesting to see what the next decade will, will hold. I love that anyone can make a short film you know uh, if you if you you know programs are kind of you know cheap enough um, the, the technology is, is cheap enough uh, the amount of uh, information that's available online is um, infinite now you know conferences like view conference are incredible um, incredible opportunities to learn at very low cost you can learn just online you know from other filmmakers experiences these are things that you know weren't there 20 years ago, um, and it'll be interesting to see what's what's going to be there in, in 20 years' time. Um, I I think that yeah, because the opportunities uh, there are so many opportunities now to tell stories in many different ways and many different uh, um, uh, you know uh, many different mediums. Um, I think it's just a, a, a incredible possibilities. I know that in Cartoon Saloon, we continue to to strive to try and tell. Uh, stories that you know uh, told from either a, like a different angle from what you're used to telling them or from what you're used to hearing them or just finding a kind of a new angle on things we're really interested in in that layered kind of storytelling I think is probably what's the, the heart of what we're interested in in Cartoon Saloon so I, yeah I think you know the future is, is, is very exciting for animation. What is your personal definition of animation? <laughs> Animation, it's, it's such an interesting question. What's my definition of, or my personal definition of, of animation? It's such an interesting question because a lot of live action superhero films, for example, have, you know, infinite, uh, you know, pieces of animation in it. And, you know, if they do their job properly, then you're not aware that it's, it's animation. Uh, for me, though, using animation as a medium, it's a distillation of storytelling. Uh, um, in a, in a particular way that you're, makes you more aware in a sense of the filmmaker, the, the, the storyteller's point of view. Uh, I, I think that distillation that animation offers, partly because it's such a time-consuming medium, you know, it takes several years to create something in animation. Therefore, you have the thoughtfulness, not just of one individual, but oftentimes, but, you know, 300 people who all streamline and direct their thought processes in, in the one direction uh, in order to bring their own life's um, experiences onto the screen. Uh, so it's that distillation, I think, is, is, is most interesting. You look at something in live action or, um, uh, and, and it's what the, what the actor looks like, what, you know, what the, you know, the, the, the set looks like, what the props, what the costumes, etc. There's so much thought in, in, in animation, it makes it quite particular. 
And the more particular something is, paradoxically, I think the more universal it is and the more timeless. I think you feel, you feel the time that animation affords its own art form. That makes it that makes it pretty timeless. I don't know if that's a definition, but it's it's something. You know, it's it's more of a meditation on, on animation, I guess. It's perfect. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.